Welcome to the University of Alberta's Opening Up Copyright Instructional Module on Publishing Agreements. Professor Pam Peterson has written an article that summarizes the results of a grant-funded research project. The granting agency requires that the article be made available in an open access environment within one year of publication. However, when Pam attempts to upload and submit her article on the publisher's website, she is directed to an automated process in which she is prompted to click through and accept the terms of a publishing agreement. If the paper is accepted for publication, this agreement will require her to transfer her rights in the work to the publisher. The automated form also suggests that publishing open access will cost her $3,000. Pam doesn't have $3,000 to spend on sharing her article and isn't sure how to interpret the language in the publishing agreement. Oh, stop, Pam, don't click. Uh, don't worry about it, Pam. As the author of the work and under the terms of her employment contract with her university, Pam holds copyright in the article she wrote. The Copyright Act gives her the sole right to publish her work when and how she chooses, unless and until she transfers this right. If Pam transfers her copyright to the publisher without retaining any rights for herself, then she will be left with the same limited rights provided to any other user of a copyright-protected work. That is, she will have to rely on Copyright Act exceptions in order to use her own work without infringing copyright and she won't be able to comply with a funding agency's requirement to make the work open access, which might make it difficult to receive future funding from that funding agency. Publishing agreements are contracts that set out the legal relationship between an author and a publisher of a work. These agreements vary by sector, publisher, and type of work, but they should all include information detailing the specific commitments and expectations of both the author and the publisher as they pertain to that work. Authors who expect to make money from their writing would normally hire a literary agent to help negotiate the terms of a publishing agreement, including advances and royalty payments. They might also use model agreements provided by trade associations to help establish reasonable terms for such a publishing agreement. But this module focuses on publishing agreements that are associated with academic journals to cover the publication of articles written for the purposes of scholarly communication. Large academic journal publishers have their corporation's legal team to prepare publishing agreements. These contracts tend to be drafted to maximize the interests of the publisher and may have little regard for the interests of the author. They usually include statements that both encourage a prompt turnaround time for the author and suggest that the author contacts a lawyer for advice before signing. In most cases, if the author has questions about the contract, including any necessary changes, these can usually be handled by the editor or publisher liaison. But if needed, authors can contact their institutional copyright expert for more information about or referral to legal services that might be available. Pam remembers a conversation she had with her university's copyright librarian about authors' rights and she chooses not to accept the $3,000 open access option or the terms of the online publishing agreement within the automated process. Instead, she sends an email to the publisher and is almost immediately provided with a PDF version of the agreement. Before reviewing the agreement, Pam considers the commitments she knows about and the potential downstream uses for the article she anticipates. She knows that these can change over time, so she creates a list that's as broad as possible. Her commitments include the funding agency's open access policy and retaining a non-exclusive license for her employer to use the work internally. Potential downstream uses include sharing the article with her future students in a classroom setting, with colleagues at professional conferences, and rewriting the article for publication as a book chapter. Pam must also provide research participants with a copy of the final article. Pam is now ready to compare her professional needs for reusing the article against the terms of the publishing agreement. Does this standard agreement allow her to retain the rights she needs to meet her professional commitments? Pam does not see the phrase copyright transfer anywhere in the agreement, but does notice that the publisher requires an exclusive license to do all the things that the Copyright Act gives her a right to do. Even though the contract is structured as a license to publish, it is essentially a transfer of all the rights associated with copyright, and it creates something called a nominal author copyright situation. This worries Pam, and it should. 
until she carefully reads the section of the agreement entitled Author Rights Retained. This section makes it clear that she will retain the right to use the post-print version of the article in a number of different ways, including sharing it with a Creative Commons license in an open access repository six months after the final version of the article has been published. This will satisfy her funding agency's open access requirement without Pam having to pay the $3,000 fee for immediate open access via the publisher's website. The author rights retained section also makes it clear that the final published version of the article can be used internally by her employer, shared with her students in a classroom environment, and emailed to a limited number of research collaborators for personal use. There is even a clause about authors being able to include the article in a non-commercial thesis, which reminds Pam of another article she's writing with a graduate student, and she makes a mental note to check the agreement for that publisher for similar language. Pam is feeling a lot better about the possibility of signing this contract. However, while there is language in the agreement about adapting the article for future publication as a book chapter, the wording is confusing. In addition, the clause that mentions professional conferences seems only to allow for the distribution of print versions of the article. Who still wants print? Pam decides to contact her copyright librarian for advice before emailing the publisher or her journal editor. The librarian offers to review Pam's draft email and, if needed, to consult with her colleagues in the Scholarly Communications Office before Pam sends the email response to the journal editor. Pam is grateful that others on campus care about her work and her need to protect her rights in that work. Within a few days, Pam emails her editor and they confirm that the changes to the agreement are acceptable. Pam receives a new publishing agreement with the modified language and saves a copy to her permanent files. It turns out that Pam's requests were not only reasonable, they were also frequently asked by other authors. As a result, language allowing for these types of uses could very well be added to future publishing agreement templates. The world of scholarly communications and academic publishing is changing quickly. The open access movement, including funding agency requirements, has been motivated by the commercialization and concentration of the academic publishing industry since the 1980s, which has resulted in high profit margins for corporations as changes in technology made production and distribution easier and cheaper. However, academic authors, editors, and peer reviewers continue essentially to donate their intellectual property and volunteer their time and effort as part of this publishing process. Why should Pam, who has been funded by the government to conduct her research, have to pay a private corporation to be able to share the results of that research? And why should a university library, which is also government funded, have to pay to obtain access to Pam's research articles? And why should taxpayers, who paid for Pam's research in the first place, have to pay to obtain access to Pam's article. The publishing world's response to these questions continues to develop, and policy changes are often expressed through the evolving terms of their publishing agreements. You should now be able to identify key elements of an academic publishing agreement, Locate support regarding author's rights and publisher negotiations in a post-secondary context. And understand the evolving scholarly communication ecosystem. This has been the University of Alberta's opening up copyright instructional module on publishing agreements. Thank you for your attention.